September 13th, 1857, quite a long time ago. He was born to his mother, Veronica Buckwalter Snavely, and his father, Henry Hershey. But I think we can all agree, Veronica Buckwalter Snavely Hershey, that is a name. Anybody that knew her would call her Fanny. Now, we're not 100% sure why anymore, and being the historical conductor that I am, I've gone on to Google, and I'm doing some of my own Fanny research. However, I'm a little behind. I'll take it even if it's forced. <laughs> the next time you ride the trolley though, I'll get to the bottom of that research. Now, yeah. they only get better from this point forward. Now, Fanny Hershey, she came from a very, very strict Mennonite farming family, the Snavely family in the city of Lancaster. This meant she would wake up very early in the morning, well before the sun rose, do a full hard day's work on the farm, before going to bed very early with a sense of accomplishment. Now, her husband, Henry, he also came from a strict Mennonite farming family, the Hershey family, but Henry did not enjoy the farm life whatsoever. He liked staying in bed until about 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. Now, Henry, not only was he a farmer, but he's also a dreamer and an inventor. He came up with 17 different ways to get rich quick, and none of them worked. Yeah, no, none of them worked. And because of this, the family did grow up very, very poor. Mr. Hershey attended seven different schools by the time he was only 14. He only had what we believe is a fourth or a fifth grade formal education. At the age of 14, he drops out of school, helps out his mother on the family farm. When he's 15 years old, Fanny repays the favor, gets him an apprenticeship with local candy maker and ice cream parlor owner Joseph Royer right in the city of Lancaster. And over the next four years, Mr. Hershey will learn how to make cakes, pies, caramels, and ice cream. It is a wonderful job for a 15-year-old. He can sink his teeth right into it, can he? Yes. Yeah. Now, after the four years go by, Mr. Hershey is 19 years old. The year is 1876, and he has successfully completed his four-year apprenticeship. And he's so ambitious that he starts his own business in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Now, why does Mr. Hershey choose Philadelphia? Well, just 100 years prior, the Declaration of Independence was signed down in the city of Philadelphia. Celebrating, our nation celebrating its 100th birthday, so Mr. Hershey knows there's going to be a lot of people visiting the city. And his first year of business is extremely successful. But once the party is over, everybody goes home, sugar bills go through the roof, sales hit rock bottom, and after just six years of hard, dedicated work, he goes bankrupt for the first time. 
Now, after Mr. Hershey goes bankrupt, he gets a letter from his father, who was out in Colorado. Henry, as I mentioned, he's not only a farmer, a dreamer, and an inventor, but I want you to add risk-taking to the top of that list as well. Henry is out in Colorado for the silver mining boom that's going on. Writes to his son and says, Milton, everybody's striking it rich out here. I think we could do the same thing. So Mr. Hershey thinks nothing less, meets up with his father in Denver, and the two of them try silver mining together. It didn't pan out. No, no it did not. After that failed attempt at silver mining, Mr. Hershey meets up with a local candy maker in Denver. Now this gentleman is making caramels, but he's using a brand new ingredient that a lot of caramel makers are not using. And that new ingredient is fresh milk. Mr. Hershey gonna remember this because the main ingredient during this time, believe it or not, paraffin wax, not used any longer. Now Mr. Hershey had all that fun out there in Colorado, starts to make his way back east, lands him into himself in Chicago, Illinois, trying to make a candy business out there in the Windy City. But Chicago had the same problems that Philadelphia had, those high sugar bills and low sales, fails in Chicago. But then he goes down south to New Orleans, Louisiana, Believing they're close enough to the heart of the sugar industry, sugar bills won't be as high. Well, unfortunately, that's not the case either. Sugar bills are still just as high, so he fails in New Orleans. 1883, though, Mr. Hershey goes to New York City. Because if he could make it there, he could make it anywhere. Yeah, that wasn't the case either for poor Mr. Hershey. Because after two years of hard, dedicated work in the Big Apple, he goes bankrupt for the second time. But we're going to jump to 1886. Ten years has gone by, Mr. Hershey. He's 29 years old. Has he made any money? <coughs> no, he has not. The only amount of money that Mr. Hershey has left to his name in his back pocket, he spends it on a one-way railroad ticket back home to Lancaster. When he gets home, everybody on his mother's side of the family has written him off as a lost cause, except for one relative, Fanny's sister Martha, his Aunt Maddie. When Aunt Maddie finds out her nephew wants to start another candy business right in the city of Lancaster, she helps him out the only way she possibly could, by putting a mortgage on her house. Gives Mr. Hershey the money. He starts the Lancaster Carmel Company right there in town. And just several weeks before the bank forecloses upon Aunt Maddie's house, no payments have been made. Mr. Hershey's saving grace comes to town, a traveling candy merchant from England. He tries one of Mr. Hershey's Crystal A Caramels at the hotel he's staying at. Absolutely loves them. Goes down to Mr. Hershey's shop, places an enormous order. Now that order would fill this very trolley car we're all riding on today. From where I'm standing up here to the front, going all the way to the back bench and fill every seat to the roof. But Mr. Hershey has a problem. He doesn't have the money, equipment, or manpower to fill such an order. So he goes down to the Lancaster National Bank, talks with his loan officer, Frank Brenneman, who basically tells him, Mr. Hershey, you are a poor credit risk. I can't give you any more money. And Mr. Hershey says, Frank, I have this opportunity. It's going to take me out of 10 years of debt, and I would like to show you myself. So Frank is very intrigued by this. He goes down to Mr. Hershey's Carmel Company, only to be highly disappointed in what he saw. And what he saw was Aunt Maddie and Fanny Hershey hand-wrapping caramels by themselves in a dirt floor warehouse. Now, do you, do you folks think the bank is impressed with seeing this? No, absolutely not. And I'm going to leave you on the edge of your seats with Mr. Hershey's story, just for a little bit. Because I'd like to point out some local landmarks here in town. First one off to the right there through the trees. That is Hershey Park Campground. That's one of our resort properties here in town, believe it or not. And you can bring your campers, your tents, your RVs, go for a nice long weekend of camping, if camping is your kind of thing. But for folks that don't enjoy tent camping, don't worry, they got cabins over here that you can rent. Now those cabins, they have hot and cold running water, air conditioning, color TV, microwave ovens, queen size beds, indoor plumbing, Wi-Fi, and room service. Well that's pretty cool for a campground to have room service, isn't it? Now room service is real easy. All you gotta do is pick up your cell phone and call Pizza Hut, they're right down the street. <laughs> Coming up here on the left is the Penn State Health Rehabilitation Hospital. It's an extension of the Milton S. Hershey Medical Center, which I'll show you a little bit later on. That's our hospital here in town. Over here at the Rehab Hospital, they have one of the best programs in the entire nation for the rehabilitation of chocoholics. <laughs> yeah. Anybody suffering from that horrible disease of the chocolate? Would you like to be dropped off, Norm? We got one. <laughs> you missed the you missed the driveway, Norm. You've been spared. 
Yeah, not, yeah, not very often we do we get, you don't want to be cured, do you? I don't think she does. No, that's a good answer, no. I don't think anyone of, I don't think any of, of us here on the trolley want to be cured of our of our addiction. But you're asking for your fix, right? Okay. <laughs> I was gonna say if you say no, you're on the wrong trolley. <laughs> Well, for you folks are not only on a historical sightseeing tour today, you're also on a chocolate tasting one as well. I've got quite a bit of chocolate up here at the front of the trolley that I'd like to hand out to you folks in just a few moments. But I've got a more important question to ask. Who wants to go check out the Hershey factory? Yes. Good, I was going to say, I hope quite a few of you do. Well, sadly I can't take you inside the factory today. Norm had a little incident over there. He uses it to travel extensively across Europe. While he's over in Europe, he notices that they are coating his caramels in dark chocolate because they're selling better. Now, over in Europe, dark chocolate and milk chocolate, they're a rich man's game. Over here in the United States, chocolate, especially milk chocolate, that's not going to be known until 1900. And Mr. Hershey's one of the first men to mass produce it, but he makes it affordable for the average working American. 1893, back in the United States, Mr. Hershey finds himself in Chicago, Illinois once again, but not for a business. The World's Fair, the Columbian Exposition is going on. So he takes a look at all the different vendors and exhibits, comes across the German display. It has a maroon sign with white lettering on it. It's this guy right here. The dentist. The reason why I say he's the smartest guy in town, he built his practice right next to the Reese's Peanut Butter Cup factory. Now, speaking of peanut butter cups, does anybody have a severe peanut allergy aboard this trolley? No. Nope. No, okay. So you wouldn't mind if I passed around some peanut butter cups? I don't okay. know. This factory is the Reese's Peanut Butter Cup Factory. Opened its doors in 1957. Sadly, Harry Burnett Reese never saw opening day. He passes away the year before, 1956. 16 million uh, Reese's Peanut Butter Reese's Cups come out of that factory a day. That is including the miniatures that are being passed around today, as well as the full-size peanut butter cups we all know and love. Kit Kat bars also made inside the Reese factory. Reese factory produces 2 million pounds of chocolate a day. Hershey West on the other side of the railroad tracks, they produce 3 million pounds of chocolate every day. You add the two together, you get 5 million pounds of chocolate. And a town only populated by about 25,000. I'm sorry, that's just my brain. Yeah, and it's not only populated by about 25,000. I think we can all agree that we are indeed in the sweetest place on earth. Coming up here on the right is a brand new construction site that is home of the Reese's Campus Extension. You're seeing a whole new Hershey factory being built right before your eyes. Slated to open 2025. So in just a couple of years. And what we know of this factory, it's not going to produce products. It's going to produce chocolate paste. That is the base of all chocolate making. And they'll, they'll send that off to some of the local factories like the Reese Plant, West Hershey, and then a, another one up in Hazleton, Pennsylvania that's making other products for us. Now, anybody who wish they had a Anybody looking for a career change? Reason why, okay, a couple of you are. Okay, all the way in the back, my friends in the back. So this is just for you. Have you ever had a, a dream job of tasting our products and getting paid for it? Yeah. Does that sound like somebody's dream job? Yeah. yeah. You look off to the right, you see that tan building all the way at the end of the street? Yeah. That's the Hershey Technical Center. That's where you can become a legitimate trained taster for the chocolate company and live out that dream job of being a Hershey chocolatier. Now, I'll, I'll be honest with you folks. I, I would assume if you get a full-time job over there, being a trained taster, they're going to give you free dental too. <laughs> At least I would hope so. Now, when you folks have bought your trolley tickets this afternoon, you're probably wondering, why on earth is our tour being done on this old-fashioned trolley car? And why am I dressed like this old-timey trolley conductor? Well, I'd like to share that little bit of history with you. From 1904 to 1946, we weren't considered just chocolate town. We were considered a trolley town, too. Mr. Hershey had always envisioned this fast transit system here in town. And back in the early 1900s, cars were just starting to become a thing. They were handmade, very expensive, not as reliable as they are today. Buses, you could virtually forget about them. They weren't thought of yet. The only other mass transit system besides the railroad that ran through the valley was you walked, you rode your bike, or you rode your horse into town. But the Hershey Transit Company changes all that in the early 1900s. They put down over 35 miles of trolley track. 
connecting the surrounding towns and villages. And we had quite a few different trolley cars that were zipping up and down the rails here in town. The first one, it's a perfect example because we're all riding on it this afternoon. So the coaster in Hershey Park, it's 200 feet tall and has a max speed of 75 miles an hour. It is a lot of fun during the summer. But we're making our way into downtown Hershey. Wonderful boutique shops and restaurants on both sides of our trolley. Coming up here on the right, Chocolate Avenue, great, wonderful little restaurant. Fenicia's Italian restaurant just up the street here is one of my favorites. It's been in business for over 90 years. So if you want some good homemade Italian food, check out Fenicia's. Off to the left, Hershey's Story. That's our museum here in downtown. They have original chocolate making equipment inside. There's a chocolate lab, chocolate tastings. And one of my favorite artifacts is actually on display inside that museum. But I can't tell you what that artifact is just yet because it goes with the story that I have for the end of the tour. And we are turning on to Coco Avenue, which is our second main street here in town. Coming up here on the left, big, beautiful building. That's our old community center built in the 1930s during the Great Depression. But I want you to think of it more as a glorified YMCA with bowling alleys and swimming pools inside of it, later on a hospital and then a junior college. The back side of the building where the marquee is, is home to Hershey Theater. We've had quite a few off-Broadway shows come through here, such as Hairspray, My Fair Lady, Sixth Musical, Mean Girls, Chicago, Come From Away is playing up until tomorrow night. We've had quite a few off-Broadway shows come through here. Now who here on the trolley loves our Reese's Peanut Butter Cups? Good, good, good. Who wants to see the house where they were developed? I'm going to show you that house in just a few moments. It's going to be coming up here on the left. It will be a pale blue house with maroon shutters. First one down Ariba Avenue. Pale blue maroon shutters. There it is. Yeah, that tiny little pale blue house with the maroon shutters was the home of Harry Burnett Reese, his wife Blanche. And that is where the Reese's Peanut Butter Cup was developed in their basement back in the 1920s. Now, the Reese's did have their own research staff living in that home as well. It was their very own children. <laughs> oh, you laugh. But they had 16 children. Wow. Ten girls and six boys in a house that only had one bathroom. Oh. Yeah. Coming up here on the left is a one square mile of donated lamb that Mr. Hershey donated for the sole use of public schools, parks, and any type of public recreation you could think of. Here come our tennis courts, surprisingly not taken over by the pickleball people today. But here comes our new community center with its new public park out front. Now this new public park, this is Coco Towers, wonderful area during the summertime when we come by here and see all the kids out outside playing. But then also here comes our, our, outdoor, our uh, outdoor pool complex. Now, the outdoor pool complex did close Labor Day weekend, and of course, shortly right after, children get a phone call saying they could come here tuition free. The school pays for everything. That is including their medical expenses, room and board, clothing, and part of college. And the students here, they can receive up to $95,000 in scholarships just for their post-secondary education. All of that started in 1909 by Milton and Kitty Hershey. And I'm going to show you the little farmhouse where that took place in just a little bit. When Mr. Hershey was asked if, if it was his idea to start this school, he would always lovingly say, no, it's not my idea. It was Kitty's. Coming up, coming up to one of my favorite buildings here on the campus, this beautiful dome building. This is Founders Hall, built in the late 1960s, dedicated to the founders of the school, Milton and, Kip, and uh, Kitty Hershey on September 13th, 1970. That was Mr. Hershey's birthday. Back in 2016, the school closed off this building because they're doing a full multi-million dollar restoration up here. But this past March, the school reopened the building to the public and you folks can come up here and definitely take a tour of it. Now I'm sure we, we've all gone on vacation and we've met up with a couple of locals at some point on our vacations and they tell you the coolest places that are off the beaten trail that you have to check out before you go home. As a local, I'm telling you, this is one of those places. You've got to come up here and check this building out. They're open Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. They have a wonderful tour on the inside of the building, but they also have full for Jerry Farm, though, does it? No. And I'll tell you why, because all the cows mooed out. <laughs> yes, they did. The school saw that building several years ago starting to collapse, and instead of tearing it down, they did the next best thing. 
They put over $7 million into that building, making it the school's high-tech, state-of-the-art security center. So that barn is the eyes and the ears of the entire Mount Hershey school. Now the school was still an all-boys only school up until 1976. 1976 rolls around, the school changes their admittance policy to allow the girls to start coming here. And as I've been told, 1976 was one of the happiest days of the boys' lives. <laughs> 1977 is when the first girls actually started coming here to the Milton Hershey School. Today it's about a 50-50 ratio directly down the middle of boys to girls. Now if you were a student here, say from preschool all the way up to the 11th grade, home life is extremely well structured. But that structure changes when you become a senior in high school. You move out of your student home, and coming up here on the right is where the students of the senior class go. Those are transitional living apartments for the senior class. The students over here know how to do everything by themselves, and by the time they graduate, they're already a self-sustaining adult. They're usually the go-tos in college because they've already experienced what living on your own is actually like. Imagine if that was a high school requirement for all high school seniors today. Coming up here on the right, on the other side of the pine trees, and it will be hard to see, but there's a beautiful gray home back there. That gray home is the Hershey Family Home Set, the humble beginnings of the Milton Hershey School, and the birthplace of Hershey's Milk Chocolate. But more on that in a second. Where the home is original is where the stone stairs go up to the back porch, built 1825 by Mr. Hershey's great-grandfather, Isaac Hershey. This is where Mr. Hershey was born September 13, 1857. The president of the school lives inside the old homestead today. But I did mention this was the birthplace of Hershey's Milk Chocolate. It was. All those years ago, there was an old dairy barn on this property. And inside that dairy barn, Mr. Hershey had put a laboratory in where he would be seen tinkering away for over two years, coming up with that milk chocolate recipe that we all know and love today. Originally, Mr. Hershey had gone to the Swiss to purchase a Swiss milk chocolate formula. But the Swiss, they didn't want to give up their chocolate making secrets. They've been making milk chocolate forever. They've got it down to a science. They told Mr. Hershey to figure it out on his own. And in 1899, Mr. Hershey did figure it out all up here to the right. <laughs> here they come. Now the next one we're gonna see, one of my personal favorites, is a beautiful white and gray tutor. The white and gray tutor belonged to Mr. William Murray, who was the, pre the first president of the chocolate company. Now Mr. Murray had a son Chicago and teamed up with a man named Mars. Yeah, M&M's. So now you see where the second M on M&M's comes from. Fury and Mars. You folks know why M&M's are so expensive, right? No. They have to throw all the W's away. <laughs> now that wasn't one of Norm's jokes, that was one of mine. I just thought of that one. <laughs> now coming up here, off to the left, that is Hershey Country Club. They're a private golf course. That's their 18-hole west course. East course is over here. Now, before that was a golf course, the golf course doesn't go in until the 30s. That was Milton and Kitty's front yard. Pretty nice sized front yard. Mr. Hershey knew how much Kitty loved flowers and how much she enjoyed being outside when she was filling up to it. So he wrote her out a $40,000 check, just so she could have her rose gardens out there. But when Kitty sadly passes in 1915, which we'll, we'll get into that story just a little bit later on, Mr. Hershey pulls out her rose gardens, transplants them up to where Hershey Garden sits today, just underneath the Hotel Hershey. Golf course goes in in the 30s. Mr. Hershey was an avid golfer. He loved that sport so much that he always golfed with a spare set of trousers with him at all times, just in case he ever got a hole in one. <laughs> Coming up here on the on the left, this big red brick building, that's the old powerhouse to provide, provide all the electricity for everything here in town. That's where our, our iconic smokestacks are connected to. Now the powerhouse was powered off of steam generators and it provided so much steam that they piped it all across town to heat the buildings. It went as far as the Hotel Hershey. They, they heated it with the steam from down here. Now, this area was actually settled by the Scots-Irish way back in the early 1700s when they immigrated over from Derry, Ireland. They would spend the next 183 years building churches, taverns, schoolhouses, and post offices, and making little villages. The villages, the village that we've been in was known as the Village of Derry Church. Now the Village of Derry Church still does exist today, just a very small remnant of it does. Coming up here on the left, you'll see that there's a small glass enclosure with a log cabin inside of it. It has red supports around a black roof. That is the original meeting house 
from the original Dairy Presbyterian Church, and that dates back to 1732. The same year, President George Washington, our first U.S. President, was born. Now that building is considered to be one of the oldest unrestored structures in North America because the wood that holds it up today, the same wood from 1732. Doing pretty well. Mr. Hershey had that enclosed in glass back in the 1920s. He wanted future generations to come and take a look at it, which is pretty cool. But that's not why Norm and I brought you fine folks up here today. Even though that's real cool and colonial and all, that's not why we're up here. We're up here for this gorgeous mansion. This is what I call the most beautiful home in Hershey, Pennsylvania. This is the home of Milton and Kitty Hershey. This mansion is closed off to the public. Now, it is a beautiful 22 room Colonial Revival limestone mansion. It is built out of that beautiful Pennsylvania limestone Mr. Hershey knew about underneath the ground here. Now, before construction started in 1906, Mr. Hershey had quite enough money where he could have gone up to New England and built one of those beautiful, sprawling country estates like the millionaires of his time were doing, like the Vanderbilts, the Rockefellers, the Mellons, or the Carnegies. But Mr. Hershey wasn't like that. He was rather frugal with his money and stuck to this relatively small 22-room mansion. Construction started in 1906. It was officially completed in 1908. When it was finished in 1908, it only cost Mr. Hershey a top dollar of $53,433. Now, that, what would that be in today's money? We have no idea. This house has never been appraised because the Hershey's are the only two people to ever live inside of it. And I'll get into that in just a moment. But would you folks like some more candy? Yes. Okay. Yes. Let's see, I've got white chocolate going down on this side and dark chocolate for you folks on this side. Now, I did, I did mention that the Hershey's are the only two people to ever live inside this home. Milton and Kitty only spend six years up here at this beautiful, beautiful home. In 1915, Kitty will sadly pass away. And when she does, Mr. Hershey takes the key to this mansion, locks it up, and vacates it for 15 years. This entire mansion, right above the front door, here living with Kitty. Coming up here on the left is a one-room schoolhouse in the little nook below us. That one-room schoolhouse is where Mr. Hershey attended second grade from 1863 to 1864. Now, 1863 and forest, you know, it's a lot darker in U.S. history. The American Civil War is going on during that time. Even though Mr. Hershey takes one of his valuables, a glass jar of pennies, buries it in the backyard behind the homestead. When they return October of 1863, he runs out to the backyard, tears it apart, trying to find those pennies. But he must have hit them real well because he didn't remember the exact spot where he buried them in the first place. When he was living up there with the, up at the homestead with Kitty while the mansion was under construction, Kitty saw him in the backyard, tearing it up again, trying to find those pennies. Still no luck. Those pennies are still believed to be up there at the homestead. Anytime we go up there during the warmer months when the gardeners are up there planting the flowers, we'll see at least one or two of them walking around with a metal detector trying to find those pennies. And you know what? They'd be worth a pretty penny today. Yeah. Coming up here on the right is our iconic Hershey smokestacks, yellow cocoa bean silos, and our cocoa bushes. The yellow cocoa bean silos could hold a six month supply of cocoa beans that equals to roughly around 93 million pounds of cocoa beans. So quite a few chocolate bars can be made out of them. But what I'd like you folks to imagine though is a chocolate factory standing taller than those cocoa bean silos and then coming out here to Chocolate Avenue. Really gives you a good idea of how big this building once was. Over a million square footage of, of factory space inside this building. This limestone factory had a working career from 1905 to 2012. So not too long ago, this factory, this factory was uh, shut down. I can still remember going back to the early 2000s, visiting Hershey Park and smelling the chocolate coming right out of this building. And that was if the wind blew the right way. If the wind blew the other direction, it wasn't as nice. There was nothing but Pennsylvania dairy farms. Oh. Now the original factory, it doesn't produce chocolate anymore but what they use it for is actually rather rather interesting they use the original factory for the corporate offices and the world headquarters for the entire chocolate company and up until 1973 you could take a tour of the original factory and 
see how chocolate was made. Did, I, did, anybody, did anybody do the tour? You guys, okay, good. Now, Chocolate World this year is celebrating 50 years. They opened June 30th, 1973. Do I have anybody born in 1973 aboard the trolley car? Nobody born in 73? Okay. The reason I, I, I ask that is because with Chocolate World celebrating 50 years this year, so could you. All you gotta do is just show your driver's license at the main ticketing desk and they'll give you a, a uh, commemorative chocolate bar to remember it by. That's only for if you were born in 1973. Dang it. Well, right now, we're actually headed over to the fun side of town. We're gonna go see Zoo America, as well as Hershey Park. You might, maybe we'll see a couple roller coasters fly by us today as we go past the amusement park. We're gonna talk about Zoo America first. The zoo starts in 1910, when Mr. Hershey opened up his private collection of wildlife. Today it has over 200 North American animals, including black bears, grizzly bears, and gray wolves. The bear sanctuary over here is so well done that it led to a little incident we had about three years ago now, where a local black bear climbed the fence and broke in. Oh. Yeah, the zookeepers came in the next day and said, that's not our bear. Coming up here on the left, you'll see a big red roller coaster with white supports on it. That big red roller coaster is Storm Runner. Storm Runner is one of 15 roller coasters that call Hershey Park home. Storm Runner is a hydraulic launch roller coaster taking you from 0 to 72 miles an hour in under 2 seconds. Now, I love roller coasters, just not Storm Runner. I'll show you my favorite roller coaster in just a little bit. Now, Hershey Park looked a lot different back in 1906. It was nothing but walking gardens and beautiful picnicking areas. It looks a little different today. It sits on 121 acres of land. has over 70 family rides. A five-acre water park coming up here on the left will open during the summer. And 15 roller coasters. So who likes roller coasters? Okay, who likes wooden roller coasters? Steel roller coasters. Okay. Coming up here on the left, you'll see a big wooden roller coaster. That is Lightning Racer. When Lightning Racer was first built in 2000, it was one of a few dual racing wooden coasters in the country. It's got two aptly named trains, Thunder and Lightning. And if you have competitive friends like I do, challenge them to a race on that roller coaster. See who buys you lunch in the park after your race. Now in our narrative, we have made it all the way up to 1915. 1915, this is actually the saddest year for poor Mr. Hershey. This is the year that Kitty will pass away. For most of Kitty's adult life, she, she did suffer from a neuromuscular disease that we really don't know what it was. We like to believe that it was some early version of Parkinson's MS or ALS from Atlantic City, New Jersey. And while Kitty's down at the ocean trying to feel better, she catches the flu. On her return, she has the top down in her car. Remember, she can't feel hot or cold. By the time she reaches Philadelphia, the flu has become bronchial pneumonia. She will not be able to fight off this infection. Her immune system is shot to, due to this disease. And she takes up residence at the Bellevue Stratford Hotel in Philadelphia, where Mr. Hershey is notified of Kitty's deteriorating health. He gets on the first train leaving town. By the time Mr. Hershey gets down to Philadelphia, Kitty is in an awful state. And right before she passes away, Kitty asks Mr. Hershey to go to the hotel bar to get her a glass of champagne. Kitty always loved champagne. It was one of her favorites. Mr. Hershey honors this request, but does not realize that she is sending him out of the room on purpose. By the time Mr. Hershey returns, Kitty has already passed away. She was only 42 years old when she passed in 1915. Mr. Hershey is beyond devastated. He will never remarry. He will keep a picture of Kitty in his vest pocket close to his heart and leave it there until he passes away himself 32 years later, October 13th, 1945. Now, 1916, it's just a year after Kitty has passed away. Mr. Hershey is still grieving. And he takes his mother and a few of their friends on a trip down to Cuba. And as soon as, as Mr. Hershey steps off the boat with his mother, his mother says, Milton, what do you see? And he says, I see sugar. We all remember what bankrupt the Mr. Hershey way back in the beginning of the trolley tour, right? It was sugar. So Mr. Hershey purchases over 65,000 acres of sugar plantations. And he cuts out the middleman. It becomes very profitable for him. But then he takes a look at the terrible living conditions of his Cuban workers. And he builds them a town, builds them a railroad, builds them a shipping port. Sounds familiar, right? He built them an identical town of Hershey, Pennsylvania. 
Now, in 1918, Mr. Hershey is coming back to the United States from Cuba. He's going up to New York City, meeting with a lawyer to go over his direct beneficiary. As we recall, Milton and Kitty never had children, so there's no direct heir to this entire fortune. Mr. Hershey says to this lawyer, I would like to give away all my money to the children of my school, but I'd like to do it now while I'm alive, not when I pass away. So this lawyer says, well, Mr. Hershey, why don't you take the school trust fund that you and Kitty started back in 1909, make that your direct beneficiary. Mr. Hershey loves that idea, signs over his wealth of $60 million. It wouldn't be until five years later that the story would break on the New York Times, the front cover of the New York Times. Now, that, that school trust fund, it has grown just a little bit over the years to well over $20 billion. That's how they can provide, provide those children of that school with a free education. And ladies and gentlemen, you help out with the school as well. You might not realize it, so I'm going to tell you how. Anytime you stay at one of our reserve properties like the Hotel Hershey up there, a portion of your money goes back to the school. Anytime you buy a, a ticketed attraction, such as the trolley at Chocolate World, a portion of your money goes back to the school. Anytime you go down there to Hershey Park, a portion of your ticket sale goes back to the school. Anytime you go see one of our, our ice hockey games, the Hershey Bears, anytime you see them play, a portion of your money goes back to the school. Anytime you buy a Hershey product at your local grocery store, a portion of your money goes back to the school. So the next time you're at your local grocery store and you're about to pick up that Snickers bar, please put it back and pick up a Reese's Peanut Butter Cup instead. So I don't think Snickers are paying for those kids at that school. But right now we're actually headed up to the middle school campus for the Milton Hershey School. Surprisingly, we're back on, middle, on uh, Milton Hershey School property. And uh, this building was built during the 1930s. It was actually built during the Great Depression. And I will name a few buildings a little bit later on that Mr. Hershey had accomplished uh, building during the Great Depression. It's rather remarkable what he does during the Great Depression. But coming up here, uh, as we climb the driveway to uh, the middle school, Mr. Hershey was up here on the 2nd of September, 1945, just a couple weeks before he does pass away. And it's the end of World War II. The entire town is up here having a party. And Mr. Hershey, and along with one of his best friends, are the last two people to leave the party. They come out of the front doors of the school, and they stroll across the lawn, overlook the entire town. And Mr. Hershey confided in his best friend, and he said these words. He said, I hope one day one of my students will descend this mighty hill and run my company for me. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I can happily tell you 14 graduates of the Milton Hershey School have done just that. They have all held top leadership positions, not only with the chocolate company, but Hershey Entertainment and Resorts. They're the people that run the amusement park down below us, Hotel Hershey, Hershey Lodge, Hershey Park Campground on the other side of town, as well as the Hershey Bears ice hockey team. Milton and Kitty always told each other, if we could help out just 100 kids, we would have done our job. But since the school's inception back in 1909, they helped graduate over 11,000 students. And just real quick, before we make this turn, we also have that black fence out there off to the right. On the other side of that, you can just see the roofs of the other 63 student homes just for the middle schoolers. So they live on this side of town. And in just a few moments, Norm's going to stop, uh, stop the trolley for us so I can point out some local landmarks that we saw earlier this evening so you can get a real nice good look at town. All right, let's see, what can we see out there tonight? Okay, so the first building is over your right shoulder. It's a big white blocky building. It looks like building blocks. Everybody kind of see that? That's the Hershey West factory. That's where I handed out all of our Hershey kisses earlier uh, this afternoon. Sitting in the foreground, the real long building with the curved roof, that's Giant Center. Giant Center is the home of our Hershey Bears ice hockey team, which this past June won their 12th Calder Cup. That is the highest ranking you can achieve in the American Hockey League, but they're the developmental team for the Washington Capitals on the National Hockey League circuit. So all the way off on the mountain ridge, you'll see all those buildings out there. There's one that has like a bluish green hue to it. That is the Milton S. Hershey Medical Center. Now, the medical center is the largest employer in town with over 18,000 employees working over there every day. The Cancer Institute is over there, the Children's Hospital, and the College of Medicine. Now, in between the medical center and us is a tan building with two towers peeking up above the tree line. That is the Reese's Peanut Butter Cup factory. That's where I handed out all of our peanut butter cups. Sitting directly 
the lowest is Hershey's Chocolate World. That is where Norman and I picked you five folks up where we're gonna drop you off in the next few moments. Behind Chocolate World, Hershey Park's tallest roller coaster, Candemonium. It's 210 feet tall and has a max speed of 73 miles an hour. And you can see Skyrush once again, that, that bright yellow roller coaster I mentioned just a little while ago. Sitting down below us as well, Hershey Park Arena and Hershey Park Stadium. The stadium is Wooden frame coming up here on the left. That is Wild Cat's Revenge. 